Chapter 22 Spring 1936 We are very happy in England. The house called Long Barn stood at the far end of the village of Seven Oaks Weald in Kent. Crooked, rambling with tipsy floors and slanting walls, it sat on a hill looking, overlooking gardens, fields, and farms. The Lindberghs laughed for joy when they saw it. It'll do, said Charles. At first, after living in Liv Liverpool, the family had headed to Wales, where they spent two secluded weeks in a private country manor just west of Cardiff. Then they moved to the Ritz Hotel in London with its carnations, gilt door handles, satin curtains, mirrors, and the telephone, and the sense that anyone may drop it drop in at any moment wrote Anne it was a luxurious base from which to serve for a suitable home in the surrounding countryside but house hunting hadn't gone well when you get to the country there are only Thatch roofed farms. No in between. No lovely old house. Anne complained in her diary. I have a headache from peering at signs in the long drive. A month later, they were still at the hotel. That was when Harold Nicholson, the friend who'd been with them, the night of the Hauptmann verdict, offered to lease them Long Barn, his country house. We have been bothered very little, Anne wrote to her mother, and seem to be left quietly alone here, both by people and press. No one grabbed at Charles or demanded an autograph when he walked through the vi village. No reporters lurked in the bushes or hung around the front door. After hiring a small staff, a cook, a maid, a personal secretary for Charles, and a nurse for John, the Lindberghs settled down to English country life. At Long Barn, Anne wrote and rewrote her next book, her narrative about their trip to China. North to the Orient had just been published when and had become a best seller as Charles had known it would. When she wasn't writing, she took long walks down country lanes and through pastures speckled with sheep. Three and a half year old John climbed fences and collected pigeon feathers, threw stones in the pond, and chased the cat. One day, Charles hung a tree swaying for him. As the boy held tight to the ropes, his father turned the swing around and around, then let it spin. 
Merry-go-round, hooted John. A darn fast one, said Charles. A darn fast one, repeated John. His parents didn't worry about their son here. No longer did guards with sawed-off shotguns follow him around, although, although Thor still tromped beside him. The German shepherd, along with Skeen, a Scottish terrier had come over separately. From a far wing of the house came the muffled squeaking of caged mice and guinea pigs. Claiming this space for his laboratory, Charles had set up his pumps and ga gas canisters and microscope. Dr. Carroll had been one of the few people who'd known in advance about the Lindbergh's departure, and he'd given his protege a new problem to solve while away. The development of a mechanical kidney. And so Charles worked on designs at Long Barn. He was constantly in touch with Carol and sometimes wrote him as many as ten times a week. They both believed Charles was making progress. The first rumblings of war. At noon on March 7th, 1936, two months after the Lindbergh's arrival in Europe, Adolf Hitler, the Nazi dictator of Germany, stepped into the rostrum in the Reichstag, his country's parliament. 600 men in brown uniforms and heavy boots, all personal appointees of Hitler, leaped to their feet. Their right arms rose in the Nazi salute as they screamed, Hail Hitler! Hitler put up his own hand for silence. Men of the Reichstag, he said in a deep, raw, resonant voice. Complete silence instantly fell over the room. Today, he had taken the first step in restoring Germany's greatness, he informed them. Just before dawn, a troop of German soldiers had marched into the Rhineland. A slice of Germany lying west of the Rhine River and bordering France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and the Netherlands on, its, on his orders. He had purposely flouted the Treaty of Versailles. Signed in June 1919 by Germany and the Allies, France, Britain, and the United States, the Treaty of Versailles had finally, had officially ended World War I. Additionally, it imposed stiff and punishing peace terms on the defeated Germans by including clauses that forced them to take full blame for the war and to pay steep financial reparations. But it was the clauses that dealt with disarmament that humiliated Germans most, reducing their army to just a 100,000 volunteers 
and prohibiting them from building warplanes and tanks. The Navy too was slashed, forbidden to manufacture submarines and large ships. Particularly frustrating was the classification of the Rhineland as a demilitarized zone. In other words, even though Germany had economic and political control of this area, Germans could not do as they wanted there. All German military installations, activities, and personnel were bar barred. These terms the Allies believed would permanently cripple the German army and create a military free area between Germany and France that would ensure future peace. But almost as soon as the treaty was signed, the Germans secretly began to rebuild their military. Manufacturers were put to work building submarines, tanks, and warplanes. Gun makers went back to producing rifles and bu bullets. And scientists found a way to make synthetic rubber and gasoline, two materials no modern war could be fought without. Soon, these products were being produced and stockpiled in four underground factories. By 1935, France and Britain knew about Germany's secret rearmament, but they did nothing to stop it. The Great Depression had forced them to deal with problems within their own borders. French and British lack of will to enforce the Treaty of Versailles was the reason behind Hitler's orders that morning. He was convinced he could get away with it. Upon hearing that Germany had occupied the Rhineland, the men of the Reichstag yelled and cried louder. Reported one American journalist, their hands raised in slavish salute their f faces now contorted with hysteria, their m mouths wide open, shouting, shouting, their eyes burning with fanaticism, glued on their new god, their f Fuhrer Hitler. A charismatic leader and mesmerizing speaker, Hitler had been the leader of the Nazi party since its establishment in 1920. He had a passion for German nationalism and a burning hatred of democracy, communism, and Jews. He believed that God had chosen Aryans, white people, and most especially Germans, to be the master race. 
and he envisioned a greater Germany, a vast new empire that would include all the German-speaking Aryans in Europe. Of course, this new empire would require space. Therefore, Germany needed to expand east under a policy called Lebensraum or living space. The proposed conquest of Central and Eastern Europe as well as the Soviet Union. The people already living in these places would simply have to make way for the Germans. As the master race, they would have dominance. All this would be run, declared by, declared Hitler, by a dictator with an array of lesser leaders taking orders from above and giving them to those below. At first, Hitler's views had not struck a chord with the Germans. Before 1930, the Nazi party had been considered a fringe group on the radical right of Germany's political spectrum, and it had received just 2% of the national vote in the 1928 elections. But then the Great Depression struck. Almost overnight, three million Germans found themselves out of work. Many lost their homes and their savings, and they blamed their government. A parliamentary republic established by the Treaty of Versailles for the downturn. Out of want came fear, and out of fear came fury. Hitler tapped into the, these feelings. His promises to put people back to work and shake off the remaining shackles of the Treaty of Versailles to restore German cultural values. values. Bringing the Jews, who he claimed had all the money to heal and make the German army great once more appealed to the people. Nazi party membership doubled, then tripled. By 1932 it was the biggest political party in Germany and Hitler, through a series of complicated intrigues and political maneuverings, using cunning intimidation and violence seized power. By August 1934, he'd made himself dictator. All government power rested in his hands. Standing at the rostrum, his head lowered as if in humility, he now waited out the exuberant pandemonium of the Reichstag. With one bold gesture, he had scraped the Treaty of Versailles. No longer would the German people be humiliated by the nations of France and Britain. His voice still low, choking with emotion, he uttered a final promise. I swear to yield to no force whatever in restoration of the honor of of our people news from the states on the afternoon of april 3rd 
1936, Charles headed into the village. It had stopped raining and three and a half year old John begged to come along. As they walked, the boy splashing through every paddle puddle, Charles pointed out the rain beads on the outside of the loop Pine leaves. Didn't they look like stars? A cable was waiting for him at the post office. Would like to offer full facilities of the United States of the United Press of America if you should desire to make any statement whatsoever in connection with Hauptmann's execution. More than a year of complicated legal wrangling had passed since Hauptmann had been found guilty. This inc included his lawyers' appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, which had refused to review the case as well as the intervention of New Jersey Governor Harold Hoffman, who expressed doubt about the verdict. I am worried about the eagerness of some of our law enforcement agencies to bring about the death of this one man, he told the press, so the books may be closed. Convinced Hoffman had accomplice accomplices and wa wanting answers to the many still unresolved questions Hoffman took the unprecedented move of launching his own investigation to the case into the case when no new evidence turned up the governor tried to bargain with Hauptmann he would communicate the prisoner's death sentence to life imprisonment in return for a complete and detailed confession but Hauptmann swore he was innocent. He couldn't confess to something he hadn't done. By the end of March 1936, all legal, legal avenues had been exhausted. Despite doubts that linger, even today authorities decided to proceed with the execution. And so, in just a few hours' time, Bruno, Bruno Richard Hauptmann would be strapped into the electric it's a, strapped to the electric the electric chair in the state prison at Trenton, New Jersey. At 8.44 p.m., the electricity, the electricity would be turned on. Three minutes later, he would be dead. Charles believed that Hauptmann would be getting what he deserved. What bothered the flyer was the fact that the American press knew the Lindberghs' whereabouts. Charles certainly would not be making a statement and he was surprised that so many Americans believed he would come home after Hauptmann's death. There has never been any question in our minds about 
returning to America, he wrote a colleague at the Rockefeller Medical Institute. Anna and I are very happy in England. In response to the cable, Charles had nothing to say. Spring became summer, and the flowers outside Charles's laboratory window bloomed. While taking a walk across the field one evening, he caught a rabbit. He carried it into his sleeping son's bedroom. Slowly, the boy opened his eyes. He blinked and a smile spread across his face. What is it, a mouse? He whispered so as not to frighten the creature. Charles encouraged him to pet it. Oh so gently, John's little fingers stroked the rabbit's soft fur. Then Charles took it back outside and let it go in the garden. Afterward, he, he and Anne went out into out onto the grass and counted the stars. Flying in Europe Charles didn't completely bury himself in the English countryside. Aviation still fascinated him. So not long after moving into Long Barn, he took a weekend and visited some nearby aircraft manufacturers. He was appalled at what he found. Much of Britain's aviation industry had been allowed to simply rust away since the end of World War One, Charles didn't understand it. How could the English be so short-sighted? They didn't... Didn't they see the import, importance of an air force? Still, he found some cause for hope. Just that year... The government had begun producing the Vickers Spitfire, a single-seat fighter that was sleek, swift, and maneuverable. Still, there weren't yet enough of them to provide much fighting power. He wondered what other countries were producing. He soon got the chance to find out. At the end of April, he borrowed a small airplane and flew to Paris. Dr. Carroll had put him in touch with a biophysicist with whom he could discuss his work on the mechanical kidney. Little about Paris impressed Charles. Almost a decade earlier, he'd landed in a vibrant city, but city, its people wild with excitement over his transatlantic fight, But now Charles observed that Paris looked run down and shabby. Buildings were boarded up. Roads and bridges needed repair. Parisians suffered f 
from fuel shortages and labor strikes and weak leadership. There is an air of discouragement and neglect, and people seem to be waiting almost from day to day for something to happen. The airplane factory he visited was also down at the heels, inefficient by American standards. The manufacturer used cheap materials, and it's mechanical designs were behind the times. While it did have a warplane prototype, the Moraine Saulnier MS-406 engineers predicted it would be another two years before it could be put into production. What amazed me was the fact that France did not have a single modern fighter available for defense, Charles wrote. Meanwhile, in Germany, on a Sunday morning in May 1936, Major Truman Smith, military attache to the American Embassy in Berlin sat down to breakfast with his wife Kay. As he buttered his toast, she flipped through a copy of the New York Herald's Paris edition. A front page story caught her eye. Charles Lindbergh had visited an aircraft factory from in France. Kay pointed it out to her husband, but husband, wasn't that marvelous? Obviously, the Lindberghs again felt safe enough to leave their son behind with servants in England. Major Smith also thought it marvelous, but for a different reason. The article had sparked an idea. He wondered if Lindbergh might be willing to visit German aircraft factories too. If so, it could be the answer to one of Smith's stickiest problems, ascertaining the strength of the Luftwaffe the Nazi Air Force everywhere Smith looked he saw airfields being built and barracks and factories springing up as Atache he was in charge of army and air intelligence and it was his job to compile data and statistics for the United States about Germany's rear moment. He felt sure that faster more modern aircraft were being built and he was deeply concerned that the day was not far off when fast-flying airplanes with powerful new weapons would appear in the sky. What exactly were the Nazis building? Despite his well-cultivated connections with the Reich, his information remained sketchy. But a visit from a man of Charles Lindbergh's stature. Well, that would surely unlock a few Nazi secrets 
especially if Smith promised the heroes attendance at opening day of the 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin. And Hitler was making elaborate preparations to showcase the Nazi regime. With the world spotlight on Germany, it was his chance to extol the vi virtues of the Third Reich, cast himself as a strong, sane, and tolerant leader, and prove that Germany had crawled out of the e economic ditch of the Depression. Most importantly, he wanted to show off the fatherland's athletes. Two years earlier, he had instituted an Aryans only policy throughout the country's athletic organizations that effectively barred German Jews from competing in the Olympic Games. Now he found. Now he touted the German Olymp German Olympic team as the stars of the Aryan race, not because of their athletic training, but because of their pure genetic makeup. The Olympics would be a, the symbol of conquest of the world by national socialist doctrine, remarked one. American embassy staffer working in Berlin. In short, it was a propaganda bonanza. As part of this propaganda, the Nazis hoped to attract celebrities from all over the world to the games. And who was a bigger celebrity than Charles Lindbergh, Major Smith presented the Nazis with his idea. Recalled Smith, it was my impression that German Air Ministry would like nothing better than to gain favor with Hitler by presenting the world famous flyer as a special guest of the Luftwaffe at the uh, Olympics. Smith was right. Eager to strike a deal, Air Minister Hermann Göring agreed to show Charles factories, research facilities, and combat in units in return for his very public appearance at the Games. Two months before opening day, Smith wrote to Charles extending Göring's invitation. I consider that your visit here would be of high patriotic benefit, he added. I am certain that they will go out of their way to show you even more than they will show us. Smith was appealing to Charles's sense of duty. Although he abandoned his country, the pilot still retained the rank of colonel in the Army Air Corps Reserve, and he had no doubt he was being asked to go on a military mission. Clearly excited about the prospect, he wrote back immediately. He'd be happy to visit Germany with his wife, he replied. All he asked was that he be treated like any other private citizen, no press conferences, parades, or special honors. Charles didn't express any concern over the darker side of Nazi Germany. Just eight months earlier, Hitler's government had passed a series of racial purity laws stripping German Jews of their citizenship and des designating them as subjects. Other laws already on the books barred them from public office, the civil service, journalism, or any mass media, farming, or teaching in German universities. 
These laws weren't passed in secret and newspapers around the world had given them front page coverage. In fact, in March 1934, on a day Charles was working at the Rockefeller Institute, 20,000 Americans had jammed into nearby Madison Square Garden to protest worsening human rights in Germany. Eyewitness after eyewitness had detailed the terror and misery they'd suffered at the hands of Nazis. The crowd in a mock trial had even convicted Hitler as and his regime for crimes against civilization. The event made national headlines. It is doubtful Charles could have missed all this. And he certainly could not have overlooked the cable he received just before leaving for Germany. It was from Roger Strauss, co-chairman of the National Conference of Christians and Jews in the United States, an interfaith organization dedicated to ending religious pr persecution. Strauss urged the Lindberghs not to go. I am convinced that the German propaganda department will try to interpret your visit as an approval of their regime, he warned. Charles ignored Strauss's entreaty. His trip was about aircraft, not politics. How, he wondered, could his appearance possibly give aid to anti-Semitism?